everyone, welcome. My name is Deb Miles and I just wanted to welcome you all here to the 2018 Social Justice Lecture. Thank you, it's very pleasing to see so many people have come along. Um, I'm just going to talk very, very briefly and let you know the structure of tonight and then I'll, I'll hand over to the, the real speakers. Um, tonight we're really privileged to be able to welcome Professor Heather Douglas to um, present the lecture. After that, we then will have a period of time for some questions, and then we um, will call on Emeritus Professor Ross Thorpe, who will just do a short response to the, the comments and the, and the ideas that Heather has presented, and then some more time for questions and comments from all of you. So that's generally how we're looking at it, and I hope to have you out of here by 7.30. Not that we'll be trying to kick you out, but you know, you'll be welcome to. Um, go by then. Um, I'm just going to hand over to the Head of Social Work, um, Associate Professor Noni Harris, uh, to begin the proceedings for tonight. Thanks. Thank you very much, Deb. I have a little bit of a speech and mostly it's telling us a little bit about Heather and her achievements. But just wanted to begin by saying, as the Head of Social Work, I'd like to welcome Professor Douglas here today. I'd also like to welcome Emeritus Professor Ross Thorpe and also um, JCU staff that are here, JCU students and the Townsville community as well. So here we are, 2018 Social Justice Lecture and our topic tonight is Domestic Violence and the Law, Achievements and Future Directions. So the Social Justice Lecture Series is presented annually and is made possible and in, as is in honour of Emeritus Professor Rosamond Thorpe, our retired professorial chair of social work here at JCU. Ros's tireless commitment to social justice for disadvantaged and disempowered people has and continues to inspire and enhance social work practice here in North Queensland. How lucky we are, really. Ros's commitment to social justice is an evident in her invaluable work in the Townsville community, particularly the Family Inclusion Network, known as FIN, and also in her continuing engagement with JCU and its students, providing our students on placement at Finn, an opportunity to experience radical social work at the grassroots. In a guest lecture to our final year students, Rod, Ros urges them not to relinquish their social work heart and soul, but to live their commitment to social justice work, a valuable reminder for us all. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Douglas. Heather Douglas is a Professor of Law and Australian Research Council Fellow and a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and the Australian Academy of Law. She is based at the Law School, the University of Queensland. Professor Heather Douglas researches in the areas of criminal justice and domestic violence and has published widely <coughs> on criminal justice issues and legal responses to domestic violence and child protection. In 2014, she was awarded an Australian Research Council Future Fellowship to research the way in which women who have experienced domestic violence use the legal system to help them lead violence. She was the lead researcher and project coordinator with the Australasian Institute of Judicial Administration on the Development of the National Domestic and Family Violence Bench Book, a project funded by the Australian Commonwealth Government. Between 2012 and 2015, Heather was the lead <coughs> chief investigator on the Australian Feminist Judgments Project, funded by the ARC. In other research, Heather has considered the criminal justice responses to fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and to the drug cat. Her earlier work explored the work of Justice Martin Kreiwald, the sole judge of the Northern Territory Supreme Court during the 1950s 
and more generally the relationship between Indigenous people and the criminal law. In 2012, she co-authored <coughs> with Professor Mark Finane, Indigenous Crime and Settler Law, Wide Sovereignty After Empire. In 2016, Heather was appointed as a member of the Australian Research Council's College of Experts. From 2001 to 2007, she was a part-time commissioner with the Queensland Law Reform Commission and in 2004, she was a visiting scholar at the Centre for Socio-Legal Studies at Oxford University. Heather was appointed a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Law in 2013 and a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia in 2017. In 2016, Heather was an, was an Institute of Advanced Studies Fellow at Collingwood College, Durham University. And in 2018, Heather was a Fellow at the Humboldt University Faculty of Law and Centre for Transdisciplinary Gender Studies in Berlin. I think you'll agree we are indeed honoured to have you <laughs> with us today. Wow. Um, and welcome. Thank you, Heather. That's my whole life there for you. Um, uh, thank you so much for that really kind introduction. Uh, before I start, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose land we meet and um, honour their present, past and merging elders. Um, I am really honoured also to be here tonight uh, for this lecture. Um, it's, uh, Ros Thorpe has been an important person in a, a, an important part of my life when I was working in child protection some years ago. Um, we were talking about when we first met, and I think it was probably around 2009, 2008. I thought 2008, but Ros reminds me because she's very quick. Uh, it was probably 2009 at a Family Inclusion Network conference. But my recollection, and I searched my emails before I came up to do this lecture, uh, was an email in 2008 where uh, I'd already must have had some contact with Roz because a woman contacted me and her children had just been removed and she was very distressed and I didn't really know who to turn to so I contacted Roz in the morning and by the afternoon Roz who was in Townsville had someone in Brisbane that she could put the woman that I'd been contacted by in contact with to deal with this issue. She was just incredible and incredibly quick. Um, and certainly when I started looking at um, child protection issues uh, around 2000, probably around 2008, 2009 and significant work up to around 2010, um, Roz and the Family Inclusion Network and her work there were really important and Roz often connected Tamara, my research colleague in that work, to people to talk to for focus groups and so on. So uh, she played a really important role in some of the research that I've done. Um, of course, uh, the reason I got inter in, interested in child protection work was actually through my work in domestic and family violence. And I worked with Tamara Walsh because Tamara got interested in um, child protection work because of her interest in homelessness. And we were both colleagues at the University of Queensland and we realised just there was this constant refrain about child protection when we looked at domestic violence or when she looked at homelessness. So then we did a range of ta uh, focus groups, which resulted in a number of articles a few years ago. And I'll come back to talking about child protection, child safety in this talk, um, but that will be in a little while. Um, first of all, though, um, I want to kind of in introduce the problem that I really want to focus on. Now, I'm a lawyer, so I'm interested in law and legal responses. So that obviously is going to be the focus of this talk. Um, since that early work when I was looking at domestic violence in 2008, it really hasn't gone away. Obviously, it's come even more strongly under the, under the spotlight. And I think we're learning more and more about it. Increasingly, we're recognising the harms associated with it uh, and we're trying to change our laws in response to those harms and in response to the issues that it raises. First of all, though, I want to start by acknowledging the gendered nature of domestic violence and the harms that it causes. The National Council to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children identified that the biggest risk for becoming a victim of sexual violence or family violence is being a woman. 
and uh, that remains the case since that, that report came out. The National Personal Safety Study also has identified that women are more likely than men to experience actual or threatened sexual violence or emotional abuse by a partner. They give a statistic of one in six women reporting that they've experienced physical violence from a partner. And in close to some of the work I've been doing in recent years, in over 70% of cases where a woman is the victim of homicide, it's her past intimate or current intimate partner that is the killer. And we just have a recent example of that in the news this week. While women are particularly vulnerable to domestic and family violence, Torres Strait Islander women, uh, women from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, young women, Put that over there, see if I can talk about it. Young women, is that okay? And women with, uh, tell me if you can't hear me, women with um, physical and intellectual disabilities are even at greater risk of harm. In 2014-15 statistics, we see that uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are 32 times more likely than non-Aboriginal women be hospitalised as a result of violence um, associated with assault in the domestic sphere. In remote communities, the numbers go up to 50 times more likely. So these are really, this is a, a group of women that are increasingly uh, at dire risk of violence. More recent work that I've done, though, has shown that not only are they more likely to be hospitalised, they're much more likely than their non... Okay. We're both off now. OK. I'll just... I'll just keep going. Okay. Um, okay. Pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> so research that I've done lately, though, has looked at women uh, who've been uh, in touch with the protection order system. And that research shows that if women are imprisoned for breaches of protection orders, well, 69% of those women who are imprisoned in relation to breaches of protection orders are Aboriginal women. So the statistics are quite startling in this area and obviously justify our continued focus on uh, the experiences of Aboriginal women in relation to domestic and family violence. Um, the other thing to note is also, maybe I'll just move away from here, just go away from all that technology. Um, another thing that the National Personal Safety Study also tells us is that women, women, when women report domestic and family violence, they also report that their children were present and either heard or saw the violence. So that is obviously another grave concern. Of course, we all know, especially social workers here in the room, that, women, that children don't need to actually see or hear the violence to experience family violence. They might experience the aftermath of violence, having to call ambulances or police. They may see the damaged furniture, the injured pets. They may indeed ultimately be removed by child safety as a result of it. So clearly children are, are seriously affected by domestic and family violence as well. Uh, research is increasingly show, showing us the effects of domestic violence in the longer term as well. Uh, we now have longitudinal studies that show that women way down the track are significantly affected by domestic violence if they've experienced at all in their past. We know also that 2% of the burden of disease for adult women in Australia is directly associated with domestic and, violence, domestic and family violence. So clearly it's a really big problem. And clearly, those problems that I've outlined are not going to be fixed with legal responses. Legal responses are just going to be one of the responses that we need to think about. Obviously, housing's a big part of the picture, economic responses, educational responses, cultural change, and so on. So law is definitely just one part of the picture. But every year, many, many women go to law to try and live safer lives away from violence. In 2016 to 2017 in Queensland, there were 32,000 applications for protection orders. That's just growing every year. So protection orders are a common response uh, women make to domestic and family violence. Um, obviously also women go to the family court or they're pushed into the family court by a, a partner uh, to deal with issues around contact with their children and, and property settlements in the aftermath of violence as well. 
They engage with child safety services, we know that as well. And some women on insecure visas may also have to engage with the migration system uh, to escape violent relationships when they have, for example, a spousal visa. Um, of course, there's also criminal law. So there's many areas of law where women are engaging with legal systems and all of these legal systems have different definitions for domestic and family violence. They have different practitioners working within them. Usually a practitioner who will work with family law probably won't do the criminal law and so on. So it's a very fragmented legal system and this is a really big problem. Nevertheless, it plays a really big part in these women's lives. So I want to have a look, first of all, at the, the central idea of what domestic and family violence is in the legal system before kind of continuing on. So over the years, there's been a whole lot of reports about this issue, and many of you will have read many of these reports. But in my world, uh, the, the, one of the really big important reports of recent years was the Australian Law Reform Commission's report on the legal system. So the law, legal frameworks that interact with family violence. And um, they discovered, surprise, surprise, anybody who's been working in this area knows this, of course, that they uh, conflict and they overlap and they're unclear and there are gaps. And um, they made a whole range of recommendations, some of which have been put into place, but some of which we're waiting for still since 2010. One of the central things they said, and this has been mirrored in subsequent reports, like the recent Royal Commission into Family Violence in Victoria, and the Not Now, Not Ever report in Queensland, is that we need to settle on a stable, consistent definition of domestic and family violence. And the definition at the ALRC report in 2010 recommended was that it should encapsulate coercive and controlling behaviours within the definition. Queensland's picked that up in the protection order legislation. The family court, which is Commonwealth legislation, has picked that definition up in Commonwealth legislation. Victoria's picked it up in their protection order legislation. We're yet to see it picked up in the immigration legislation, for example. So there are still places we need to go uh, with this definitional change, but certainly there seems to be broad agreement that it needs to include this notion of coercive and controlling behaviour. Um, in, in some other states, there's still reforms to be made and there's, each state is doing this differently. So although we have coercive controlling behaviour as part of our definition for protection order legislation in Queensland, it's slightly different in Victoria and in the Family Law Act, even though we've picked up this notion of coercive and controlling behaviour. So um, lots of researchers who've worked in this area have also identified this need to encapsulate domestic and family violence as coercive and controlling behaviour. And I think most of us probably think of Evan Stark as at least one of the uh, people that has recommended this kind of approach. And he explains that coercive control refers in essence to a pattern of abusive behaviours involving the exercise of control with the aims of this behaviour being to instil fear and ultimately to take away the victim's sense of freedom and autonomy. The effect of these coercive and controlling behaviours is cumulative and gradual. For most women, it starts slowly. I, give it, I asked some of the women who I spoke to in a study I did recently, interviewing 65 women about domestic and family violence, about early red flags in their relationship. And one woman gave an example of how she was at, the, this is how she met her partner. She was at a hotel, at what she called a hen's night, talking to her girlfriends, and there was this guy trying, constantly coming over and saying, let me give you my number, I wanna, can we connect? You know, basically trying to ask her out. And she kept saying, no, don't want anything to do, leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone. And eventually, just to keep him at bay, she said that she would take his phone number. And um, she was, she'd had a few drinks, and so she was fussing around trying to put the number into her phone. And he said, look, let me do that. So he took the phone, put the number to, into his phone, and texted himself. He had her number. He pursued her for the following weeks, they went out, and then, you know, 15 years later, the rest is history. But that's how the relationship started, with him taking control of the situation. And she said that was the start. Um, certainly from my uh, interviews, women talk a lot about the micro-regulation of their daily lives. And although they may experience serious physical violence and all sorts of other uh, violence that we tend to generally associate with um, domestic and family violence, the regulation of their daily lives was really, uh, that coercive and controlling behaviour was really what got to them mention a woman from one of the interviews I did, Rosanna, a Torres Strait Islander woman. Um, 
she said that she would be timed up to school and back. She had to be back from the school every morning to drop off the kids within 17 minutes. If she was any later than that, she would cop a hiding, was her re reference to it. When she brought the kids home in the afternoon, there were all these various coloured buckets that the kids had to put all of these clothes in. They had to sit at the kitchen table and be completely silent. If they weren't silent, Rosanna would cop a hiding. So there were all these rules in her life that she had to abide by. And um, this was the controlling nature of her relationship. Dis she described, like so many women do, walking on eggshells in her home. So while physical violence obviously is, is severely damaging to these women, this, this emotional abuse, this coercive and controlling behaviour is highly destructive and obviously takes away their freedom and autonomy. Um, most of the women I spoke to when I said to them, so what was the worst aspect of the abuse? Many of them would say that it was the emotional abuse. So the constantly being belittled, um, him endlessly talking negatively about her body, uh, treating her as dirt, um, you know, saying all of these things, which for some women they described it as, well, they say it so often you start to believe it, so you feel less of yourself. So when a woman is so broken down by abuse over time, she becomes isolated potentially from her friends and family, and it can be really difficult to see a way out. One of the women I spoke to in my study is Faith, and she describes the situation in this way. She said, the domestic violence had such a hold. It's like this octopus that holds my brain. In order to break away, I have to have no contact, but it was like I was just covered in black ink that they spurt, and I couldn't see. So that's how she described it. Sometimes women do manage to escape, and that might end up in finishing the violence for some lucky women where that happens. But so often that's not the case. For so many women, it continues even after they leave. They're stalked. Um, their partners seem to always know where they are. Um, text, Facebook, so on, and court, court interactions as well. Um, some of the uh, women talked about the abuse post-separation, uh, and some of them were obvious things like the ones I mentioned, like being followed and so on. But others talked about more, um, I suppose, covert notions of continuing abuse. One of the women I interviewed, Sandra, talked about how one of the things she really loved doing, she was going through family law, her life was very stressful, she was managing two kids, she was trying to cope in the aftermath of separation, she was very fearful of her partner. One of the things she did enjoy doing was riding her horse. And her partner threatened to kill the horse. So she wanted to make sure the horse was safe, so she moved it to a new property, a new paddock. And she went a few weeks later to ride the horse at this new paddock. And when she got there, there were a whole lot of beer cans lined up along the fence of this obscure beer that she knew her partner drank. So she saw this as a completely intimidating statement of him saying, I know where you are, you know, you can't get away from me. And so it was going on, this continuing intimidation and abuse, basically. <laughs> Last week I received an email from, I sometimes receive emails from people who read something I've written and last week I received an email from a fellow who described himself as an ordinary computer programmer from Sydney and um, I don't know what they look like but that's what he was <laughs> and um, he said that he'd been thrown into the domestic violence system because he was trying to help her daughter, his daughter escape from a violent partner. So he said he just had had no experience of this at all but now he was dealing with it all. And he was saying that this, this idea of coercive control is just so important in terms of the justice system getting a handle on this and understanding the kind of behaviour that we're interested in trying to manage in this context. And he basically said, the issue of coercive, and I'm quoting from his email, so I haven't identified him because he doesn't know this, but if you're out there, um, the issue of coercive control is so important in understanding domestic violence, yet the police, lawyers and judges seem to have little awareness of the mechanics involved and how it drives the behaviour of the perpetrator. So clearly we need to keep up the training on this and the education around this, and I'm sure that's what many of you are currently involved in. So I wanted to then talk about some of the separate areas of the legal system and look at how we're going in some of these separate areas. So the first one is protection orders. So this is probably the most common place um, uh, women go, at least to start with, in relation to their legal interactions around family violence. Um, and I think we've seen some positive things happen in this space. So slowly parliaments have been trying to improve this system. And now we have, uh, since the end of last year, 
recognition of orders across the country. So if you get a protection order in Queensland, in a Queensland court, that order is now recognised since November in New South Wales, Northern Territory and so on. We know lots of women have to leave the state to escape violence or to get uh, affordable housing and so on, or to maybe go and live with relatives wherever they may be. And so often women are travelling across borders to safety. So this is fantastic because this is one thing they do not have to do. They don't have to go and organise another protection order in another state. So that's a very positive, positive outcome. Um, also in Queensland, I think we've, we're lucky, or it's a positive thing, that we've seen the introduction of the Specialist Magistrates Court, and I know you have one in Townsville. Certainly the first one, or the most recent first one anyway, was in Southport, and um, there was a review of the Southport Court just, uh, I think, just at the end of last year, and essentially it had a very positive review to make of the Southport Court. So the Southport Specialist Court is a magistrate's court. Its primary role is de dealing with domestic and family violence protection orders, but it also deals with criminal justice matters. It basically has specialised magistrates that are properly trained and specialised staff in the registry. There's a specialist family violence registry. There's also an information desk so that people that go into the court for a protection order, and sometimes this is a person's very first experience of court, gets directed in the appropriate into the appropriate place for their, for their matter. And there's also stakeholder meetings on a regular basis every week. So this is one of the problems we keep talking about over and over again, is the siloing of everyone's work. So, you know, the social workers are over here and the lawyers are over here and the magistrates are over here and the police are over here. So they have a regular stakeholder meeting every week and everybody, the, stake, the relevant stakeholders are there. So the magistrates, the police prosecutors, the local lawyers from legal aid and the relevant service workers are all there in the room. They can talk about the issues that they're seeing in terms of the system and they can all kind of share information. So I think that's a really positive development and hopefully those developments will be positive in the Townsville Court as well. Um, I think the one thing that was considered uh, to be a problem was there wasn't sufficient focus on criminal law responses in those courts and I think there's some work to be done to make sure they're more consistent and that we take those issues around criminal justice responses to DV seriously. I don't think we're there yet in relation to that. Certainly the views of um, women who are using the Southport Court to get protection orders were of the view that it was working more seamlessly for them and they had a greater sense that perpetrators were being made more accountable in those courts. So there is some positive, uh, positive things happening there. Um, protection orders, as I said, are really common. They work by essentially a person going to court and getting an order and that order will have a range of conditions on it, usually to stay away from the victim or to uh, not com to not commit domestic violence or there might be other conditions associated with it. If those conditions are breached, they can the person who breaches the order can be charged with a criminal offence. But that can only happen if the protection orders are policed properly. So this is another issue I think we have in Queensland and this is one we have to watch carefully. I don't know if there are any police in the room, um, but I think this is a really key issue for us to be thinking about probably always has, but I think there's some particular problems arising at the moment. Now, women in my study, the 65 women I talked about, a lot of them had really great things to say about police. They came on time, they took me seriously, they listened to me, they helped me get a protection order, they may have charged the offender. In some cases, women reported that these police officers came back two days later to see how they're travelling. There are fantastic stories of wonderful policing. But I think on balance there are probably more stories of not so fantastic. So he didn't take the abuse seriously, they turned up not on time, sometimes took an hour, sometimes three, sometimes police didn't turn up at all if women had called police often. And that's obviously uh, terribly worrying and um, obviously very dangerous potentially for that woman. One police officer recommended to a woman that she should get a private security officer because she was calling way too much. Um, another police officer, when he took away the woman's partner, said, oh, love, can we get a beer for him from the car for the way around to the mate's house? So there was a sense of alignment that these police officers were aligning with the perpetrator. So clearly there's a lot of work to be done there. 
Um, also, one of the particular concerns was that uh, protection order conditions were often determined narrowly by police officers, especially if there were children around. So often a refusal by police officers to act on breaches of protection orders if there was any suggestion from the perpetrator usually that he was just exercising rights to see children, even though there was an allegation of clear domestic abuse. So that's, that's a real problem with this family law uh, civil protection order conflict, I think, here, because it's Commonwealth law and the family law, state law with the protection order. So fed, the, the local Queensland police feel trumped by the federal family law. I don't know that there's necessarily any need for that. They can still act on domestic violence. The family law courts don't support that. They don't support domestic violence. But that's an excuse that seemed to be sometimes used by police. Some of the women in my study uh, were so frustrated by police that they decided to stop calling them. And obviously, that's a really dangerous situation for us to get into. Another common complaint from women was that uh, trivial uh, breaches are not taken seriously. So text messaging, for example. So there may be very clear conditions about no contact, but police would refuse to act on those kinds of breaches because they're technical or trivial. I've got a story to tell about technical and trivial breaches, which is a story that the, um, the uh, Queensland Death Review Council looked at. Um, sorry, the Death Review Advisory Board. They examined deaths that are related to domestic and family violence. They looked at a case involving a woman called Monique. Uh, Monique had had a very, very long-term violent relationship with her partner, who I'll call Grant. I think I call him Grant. Maybe I don't, but I'll call him Grant. And um, it had been a very long, violent relationship, lots of police call-outs, protection orders over the years. And Monique had finally moved on, and she'd left and was living separately away from Grant. And after some weeks and months of uh, going out for coffee and so on with this fella Josh, they decided to start a relationship. And um, of course, Grant didn't like that. And the abuse escalated in, in the form of text messaging. And the text messages were love messages. I love you desperately, I want you back, I never want to let you go, you're the only one who I can have, nobody else can have you, you know, you're wonderful. And they had taken these, um, Joshua, Monique's new partner, and Monique had taken these messages to the police station that day and said, we're really worried, we're in a panic, we're terrified, we're worried about these messages. And the police looked at them and said, but they're not really violent, are they? How are they violent? Anyway, later that day, um, Grant came round to the house and killed Joshua. And um, the death review committee looked at this and they said it's clear that police, or it seems, actually they said it seems, that police failed to take timely action, failed to make appropriate resources available to the case and didn't connect complaints and reports made across different police stations. So a tragic case as a result of a technical or trivial breach. And it's, you know, other, other, other examples which are less extreme and less tragic, but nevertheless do result in physical violence, are numerous, and some of you may have come across those. So they're not, there's no such thing as a technical or trivial breach, in my opinion. They need to be taken seriously. <clears throat> now, the other thing I wanted to mention was the data issue and policing, and you will have all seen the newspaper reports about um, police data breaches in recent times. This is really inexcusable and a real worry for us because... Um, we rely on police. Obviously, they have a data bank of victim addresses. And these can be disclosed, and we rely on them not to disclose them. So the recent police behaviour, which has been in the media, it's going through the courts, there's no doubt it's happened. The question is what should happen now to the police service in relation to this matter. But one of the police officers released the victim's address to the perpetrator, knowingly, and said to the perpetrator, look, just go around there and tell her you know where she lives and leave it at that. That's what the police officer suggested. So we have a problem here with policing. We haven't got everybody on the same page, so there's work to be done in relation to policing. We rely on police. They're the front-line response to this. So we really need to, to be on this and, and, and get it right. So we've got some way in relation to this. We know that about one-third of complaints are made about domestic violence. One-third of complaints about police are made about domestic violence matters. So there's still issues there. 
In fact, um, Mandy Shercor here at SEU and I have written about this and we've suggested that maybe with increased pol police powers actually comes increased police responsibility so that when police don't appropriately exercise their responsibility, maybe we should sue them. And in fact, um, historically we haven't been able to do that. But in, at the moment in Victoria, there is a case on foot. So it will be interesting to see where that goes and what happens. Another thing I wanted to talk about was what I call legal systems abuse, which I think we're starting to recognise as a real thing and part of coercive and controlling behaviour. Um, of course, when victims separate from a partner, it's often the case that they get engaged with the legal system for all sorts of really good reasons. They want protection from an order, they want to sort out the relationship they have with their kids and so on. And their partner may have really legitimate reasons to be connecting with the legal system as well. But at that point, it might be the case that the only way that perpetrator can have contact with that woman, the victim I've called them, but, but the only way they can have contact is through the legal system. So it creates this kind of perfect storm. And what we sometimes see is that there's abuses of the legal system. And sometimes these can be hard to stop. So I had one woman, I had a number of women in my study who talked about what they saw as legal systems abuse, but one that stood out was one woman called Alex, who when I saw her in the first interview I had with her, had been to court on 50 occasions in the last six months. Why had she been to court on 50 occasions? Well, every order that she had made was appealed and um, if there were, there was several breaches of protection orders, but he sought to have those breaches of protection orders dealt with on separate occasions in court. He'd also, he's also suing her through the small claims tribunal. He'd appealed the protection order to the district court. He had her in the family court appealing issues around the children. So he had her in every court and he was trying to string out these applications. Every time they turned up to court to have an application or to deal with something, he would seek an adjournment and that would get them back to court another time. He also subpoenaed all of her family and friends to all of these cases, so they would turn up to court as well. So he was causing quite a lot of trouble for her. She said, he's using the law as a tool to abuse me, but how do you get out of that? We don't, you can't just not turn up. I'm not at the stage where I have clear final orders on all these things, so I just can't not turn up. So, um, that was, that was Alex's problem in this particular case, and that's still going on for her. She's still, apart from now when her partner has sometimes been in jail in recent times for a month or two at a time because he's racked up so many breaches of protection orders, when he comes out, he's at it again. And not only that, he's now starting to be a lawyer. Um, but she says that um, although he fails in all these applications, although the appeals fail, although the requests for separate hearings on all these breaches fails, and the magistrate says, no, you have to have them all at once or whatever. Um, in spite of that, she's got to turn up and she's got to seek legal advice and she's got to fill in forms and, and do the affidavits and so on. She said, his purpose is to keep me engaged by going to court. In fact, he has actually said it. In two separate court appearances, he said it in the court. He said, I don't want those two matters to be heard together because the more I get her into court, the better it is for me. She said there was a collective gasp in the courtroom. She says it's the only way he has access to her now. So he doesn't know where he lives. She lives. Um, access to the child is in a contact centre. So court is the only place. So that's why he's so uh, focused, on, focused on that. Um, the other problem to point out here is that some of the time uh, you can get cost orders in these kinds of cases where they fail, but how do you think that you get those cost orders fulfilled if the guy doesn't just pay the money? You obviously have to go to court, new applications, which of course just plays into his hands. So this is another thing Alex said, of course she's not gonna go down that track because she doesn't wanna take him back to court. So she just racks up all these fees for, for legal services. Um, and really there's no, no way around that as far as she can see. Um, now the problem too with meddling with these application processes and narrowing them and not allowing them is that lots of women or lots of people who have experienced violence need to make lots of applications. 
they need to make lots of variations to protection orders, lots of variations to family court orders and so on. So we have to be very careful if we cut down these opportunities for legal engagement that we don't uh, get in the way of others who are making really legitimate claims in court. So it's a very difficult tightrope to walk in this area. That's why I kind of settle on this idea that um, if we have a better understanding of coercive and controlling behaviour, maybe we can improve our courtrooms to deal with these kinds of matters a little bit better. And I don't think we're, we're there yet by a long way. I don't think we have everyone on the same page about this, this idea. But hopefully better understanding of these kinds of dynamics might, as, might ensure that magistrates and judges make better decisions in relation to these matters. So that when a perpetrator applies to have a whole pile of witnesses subpoenaed to court, the magistrate says, really interrogates those and doesn't rubber stamp them and says, no, that's not going to happen. Or when there is an application for an adjournment, the magistrate says, well, this looks suspicious to me. Is this really necessary? So really taking care of all of these procedures that look like relatively neutral procedures. There are no neutral procedures in this space. Um, the other point to make too is that uh, a lot of magistrates go into protection order hearings or protection order, their day in court for protection orders not actually having read the material. And the reason why they do that is obvious. A lot of people don't actually end up turning up and the case gets thrown out so nothing comes of it. So it's a lot of wasted time. But the fact is that if people are well prepared, especially if magistrates are very well prepared, they can make better decisions across the board and hopefully that means that there's less return to court. So there's a good reason to invest in pre preparation in the cases that do go ahead. So uh, ideally we, we would do that. And a lot of the studies suggest that preparation is, is worth doing, even though there is wastage in the preparation. For those cases where you've prepared and they do go ahead, we get better outcomes. Um, so that's, I think, important for us. There's US research that would go along with that careful judicial attention to materials before trial, helps judges address the risk to survivors posed by alleged abusers and results in quicker case resolution in the end and a decrease in re-abuse. So a really important thing, case preparation. Um, we're developing resources. There's a handout on the desks, I think, about the National Domestic and Family Violence Bench Book, uh, which was mentioned also in the introduction. This is, a, I think, this is a really important resource. It's free online. Um, it's full of materials. Happy to get anyone's ideas about what other materials should be up there. We can, we can add them. It's mainly a resource for magistrates and judges dealing with domestic and family violence across the country. And the idea is that we improve the consistency of approach to domestic and family violence by magistrates and help them to understand things like risk factors and so on. So we are doing things. The Law Society also has introduced some guidelines for lawyers dealing with domestic and family violence. So we're, we're kind of aware that these practitioners need to be skilled up on the, the core ideas at the heart of domestic and family violence, like coercive control. So I've looked at protection orders, um, policing, which leads me to criminal law. And um, there's a lot of discussion around criminal law. I think it's... Um, Obviously, not everybody who is involved in family violence is going to end up in the criminal law courts, and, and that's probably fair enough. Um, many matters can be resolved through the civil protection order proceedings, and family law would be quite enough for those, those uh, for certain groups. But criminal law is important as well, and um, there's been lots of discussion in Queensland about whether we have the right toolbox of offences for domestic and family violence. And many of you will have heard uh, the debates in Queensland around strangulation. Maybe you've been to training. Um, really, Queensland is at the forefront of this, which is kind of exciting. In 2016, we introduced a strangulation offence specific to domestic violence in Queensland, a first for Australia, uh, so non-fatal strangulation. And um, I think this is really important might ask why that's really important, but of course it's the, the risk issue. So strangulation is seriously risky behaviour and also a serious risk factor. So it's seriously risky behaviour just in, it, in and of itself. You can be unconscious within seconds, dead within minutes at the pointy end, but also there's a whole lot of other injuries that one might have as a result of strangulation, um, change in voice, 
vision changes, memory loss, um, post-traumatic stress, of course, all of these things are not uncommon in strangulation, even where there's no visible injury in strangulation. Pregnancy miscarriage. Some of the really disturbing things about strangulation is that a person can die weeks or months after the strangulation has happened. So there's an issue called thyroid storm, which can cause death some months down the track, or a person might die as a result of a blood clot caused by a non-fatal strangulation event and die of a stroke sometime later. So if anyone ever tells you they've been strangled yesterday or a week ago, and they haven't been to a doctor about it because they see no physical injury, they should go to a doctor about it. Uh, and I think strangulation, the offence itself, has actually put it on the radar for people and I think people are increasingly understand, understanding the seriousness of, of that behaviour. Um, but also it's a risk factor. Um, around 50% of women who've been killed by their violent partner were strangled in the week leading up to that death. So it's a risk factor for serious harm and, um, and, and fatal harm. And um, the research is really clear on that. Uh, Gail Strack, who works on this, and maybe some of you had had tra have had training from her, she's an American strangulation trainer, and uh, she's actually been out to Australia to do training, and she says strangulation is the last warning shot. So if a woman tells you they've been strangled, A, they should go to the doctor and get themselves checked out, but B, you should be really worried for their future safety. And as I say, I think the non-strangulation offence has really helped put it on the radar, put it on the map for people, especially police who are coming out as those first responders in many cases. So I think it's a, it's a really important thing for profile change. Of course, because it's such a great idea, um, in my opinion anyway, uh, a number of other jurisdictions are following. Uh, Victoria's talking about it, Western Australia and South Australia are talking about it, and New South Wales has committed to introducing a strangulation offence. We are charging it in Queensland too. Uh, since it came in, there's over, a, over 600 prosecutions in the police reports from the last financial year and over 1,000 charges. So it is, is, is being used in the books. Another debate though, of course, the problem with strangulation is it's that old classic chestnut about domestic and family violence, that it's a single incident. And what we're trying to get people to think about is coercive control. So there is this discussion also, of course, strangulation is a single incident, but part of a pattern of, of coercive control. But can we capture coercive control as an offence? And there's been debate about that in Queensland and elsewhere about introducing a coercive control offence. Tasmania has emotional abuse. Uh, the UK has coercive control. We haven't gone down that route, but that may be a debate that we might have. So, you know, there's some things happening in the criminal justice sphere. Child protection also is another issue that women confront um, in relation to their dealings with domestic and family violence. One of the biggest obstacles for women to leave a violent relationship is having kids with her abuser. You know, having kids with your abuser, it enmeshes the woman in family violence and they stay for many, many or more years in that relationship if they've got kids with their perpetrator. Um, and as I said at the beginning, a few years ago I did some research with Tamara Walsh at my university in Queensland on child protection and domestic violence. And some of the things, we did focus groups with workers who worked with women um, who'd experienced family violence and had had connections with child safety. And um, we found a range of concerns were raised by those focus groups. And I don't think these concerns have gone away. Um, workers said, even then, and this is probably uh, 2009, even then workers said that domestic violence workers were, sorry, uh, child protection workers were sometimes not getting that notion of coercive control. They were describing domestic violence sometimes as a relationship issue. So you can have um, a violent father who's violent as a perpetrator to the woman, but he's not, there's no violence to the kids, you don't have to worry about that. Um, so it's a relationship issue, it's confined to the relationship. Uh, another concern was that, back then, was that women were being blamed for the abuser's violence. It was their responsibility, they had to control it. 
Um, and also that uh, they were being described as insufficiently protective to the children. They had to do work to protect these children, move out, whatever. And they also reported these ultimatums to leave the family home if they wanted to keep their kids. But they weren't actually given any support to do that. They weren't given housing or transport or ideas about that. They were just told to get out or the kids would go. The other thing that was really common was fear that people were fearful, incredibly fearful about child protection interaction. So of the 65 women that I interviewed, 19 of them reported that they'd had interactions with child safety. Some of those women had had their children removed and they were working hard to try and get them back in their care. But many, many others reported that they'd been investigated for child abuse themselves. They thought, but they didn't know that often those complaints had come from their partner. So they saw the child safety interventions in their cases often as um, another form of systems abuse, really, that they were experiencing. And in those cases, they were fully investigated in many cases. They had to stand down from work and so on. Um, and uh, you know, it was obviously a, a big deal that they were being investigated. But I think also really problematically is that there's this really strong association between child safety and, uh, or sorry, police and child safety for many women. So many women feel that if they, and I think they're probably right to think this, but many women feel if they call the police, that's it, the kids are gonna be taken, especially for Aboriginal women. One woman I spoke to, Melissa, was an Aboriginal woman and she felt like she was on the child protection radar and she said she never called the police for domestic violence, even though she experienced quite physically brutal domestic violence. And the reason why she didn't do it was because she thought if the police came around, her kids would get taken. So she just said, not me, not calling the cops, don't want child protection intervention. This is a real concern. It's another question about safety for everybody, that there's this association. I think it's a real worry. Um, sometimes also women, though, called child safety for actual support. There's one example of Hannah who uh, was disclosed family violence to her GP for the first time and explained what was going on. And uh, the GP was sufficiently concerned that he said she should contact child safety and talk to them about it. And Hannah did do that. And child safety said the best thing she could do was get the perpetrator and the kids together in a public place for a milkshake and have a chat. Um, others talked about the processes of removal being really problematic. So some women talked about how their kids had been interviewed in, in school and it was really obvious they'd been taken out of classes by child, work, child protection workers. So there was no sense of protecting kids in that sense. They also talked about one example where child protection workers came around at dinner time and just sweep the kids out of the house, all very dramatically. Another one talked about her perpetrator, who she insists was being not violent at that time, being handcuffed to the fence while they removed the children in front of him. So some of these behaviours seemed really problematic in terms of the processes of removal, and um, that was a real worry. One immigrant woman I spoke to um, talked about... Um, how much time have I got? Half an hour? Not much. Yeah, yeah. Not long. Yeah, yeah, 10 minutes, five minutes, yeah. Okay, so um, one of the experiences of the immigrant women was particularly concerning. Uh, she talked about how she'd been living with a violent perpetrator for some years. She'd come on a tourist visa. That tourist visa had lapsed. She had a small baby. She was breastfeeding. She was essentially an illegal immigrant in Australia. Terrible violence that she was experiencing. One day, the violence got so bad that she escaped and she, she ran next door to the neighbours who got ambulance police involved, took her to safe refuge. Uh, but the initial response of child safety to this breastfed child was to leave the child with the father. The child was left with the father for some months before the woman got a bridging visa and, and family court intervened to take the child back. But of course, she could no longer breastfeed. Um, and of course, there's the system as abuse. Just a couple of things before I finish then uh, is some emerging issues that I wanted to, to mention that I think we're just starting to see alongside legal systems of use. One is reproductive coercion, which I think uh, is a really important issue. Um, I think we need to be talking to our clients and uh, to, uh, to people that, about this issue. 
get it on the radar as well because obviously the point about getting enmeshed in violent relationships if you have children with those partners. So talking about um, reproductive coercion is, is an important part of that conversation around family violence, I think. And that reproductive coercion uh, includes um, things like, uh, well, basically trying to control women's reproductive autonomy. So it might include things like tampering with contraception um, or pressuring or forcing a woman to become pregnant and so on, or forcing her to have an abortion or forcing her not to have an abortion or whatever it might be. Um, Kim's example, I think, is most compelling for me in terms of the women I spoke to. She said she met a fellow online. They're a bit older. They weren't planning to have any children together. They discussed it. They agreed to use contraception. It wasn't a very serious relationship. But one evening, uh, the sex got rough and he pulled the condom off and persisted with the sex. She insists that was the night that she got pregnant. So she found herself in a relationship with this fellow for five years. It became very violent when she went through the pregnancy. She quit her job to stay home with that child, uh, so she became increasingly isolated. Um, and for her, that moment of reproductive coercion really started this chain of dreadful events. So it is a really serious issue for women. So I think talking about things like long-acting contraception in violent relationships is really important, or invisible contraception for those women that don't want to leave but don't want to have children with a, a violent abuser. And the final issue I wanted to just put out there was obviously technology-facilitated abuse, which we know is getting more and more common. One woman I spoke to, for example, uh, was in shelter after leaving a violent partner. She was in shelter with her child. She was dutifully allowing her partner to see this young child on a regular basis, and that partner gave the child a doll and some other toys. Uh, but of course, uh, that doll turned out to have a GPS in it. And so this partner was tracking her to the shelter. She had to leave the shelter. It was some weeks before she realised what was going on when she opened up the back of the doll and found the GPS device inside it. And there are other examples of that, people putting planning cameras in the house. I mean, the, the examples are extraordinary. So there's great possibilities there. And I think the real possibilities are happening now with the smart home revolution. Uh, I got another um, unsolicited email recently uh, where the woman who wrote to me talked about gaslighting and talked about how we no longer need gaslights, which is from the 1940s mov movie of the same name. Great movie if you haven't seen it. But she says, um, which where the partner turned off and on the gas lights, and so the woman felt like she was going crazy, so that was kind of part of the controlling behaviour. This woman wrote to me and she said, the process no longer requires the dimming of gas lights, but can be done virtually via smart technology, which makes this form of abuse even more dangerous. For a start, how do you even begin to explain to someone that TV is informing your abuser of your every move or that your refrigerator is turning your lights on when you come home? Sounds crazy, right? Who wouldn't question someone's sanity if they told you that their heating was spying on them at the behest of their abuser? So I think this is possible. This is the sort of new world. It's probably happening in some places now. And we need to really get technology companies engaged here so that we can have safe use of technology. We can't be telling people to cut off. It, that's just not going to work. So we need safe technology. How are we going to do that? I'm not sure. But that's sort of the new frontier. So I haven't mentioned the Family Court. Um, there is a review of the Family Court going on right now with the Australian Research Council. So if you have experiences of the Family Court, personally or through your work. Obviously, you should long on, log on to the Australian Law Reform Commission and um, tell them you want to receive their updates and make submissions about what you know. Um, but obviously, that system is very broken and um, people are appreciating that. So there is, a there is uh, this inquiry going on. So hopefully, we'll get some positives out of that. So just to end on one final quote, which isn't very hopeful about the law, uh, but ne nevertheless, I think it sums it up for most women's experience of this system or these systems. Uh, Colleen said, everyone thinks she was so loved, but if they really stop to ask the question, how bad would the physical, mental and emotional abuse have to be before you would walk away from all you owned, from your home, your possessions, your money, facing thousands of dollars in debt, how bad would it have to be for you to stare down three and a half years of legal proceedings, court dates, letters and police visits? How bad would it have to be? Nobody wants to ask that question. That's really what's behind every woman's flight. Thanks. Oh, sorry? Don't go too far. Oh, okay. All right. I'm sure you'll agree that that was 
an outstanding presentation and one that I am so proud to have been able to, to be um, a part of listening to. I just want to take one minute to um, point to a particular and um, unintended but nonetheless inexcusable omission on my part in my confusion at the beginning of the lecture, I did not acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we stand, which Heather on Bindle and Woolwaruk are people. Thank you for doing that acknowledgement yourself for your, your speech. And I think as, as you would have heard through Heather's presentation, that's uh, not something that I just wanted to hope you all didn't notice because I knew every single one of you would have noticed. Um, and so you should have. But I think that the content of Heather's presentation today indicate how important it is for us to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, uh, women in particular, as people very involved in this issue and as people who are working really hard alongside people like Heather to resolve this issue. So again, um, I acknowledge my um, omission in, those regard, in that regard. Can I now just, is there anyone who has a question or a comment briefly that they would like to put um, at the at the end of Heather's presentation, there. Yeah. Um, I work with Ros, and I have currently two families, two mothers that have been um, that have had an abusive relationship. Both mothers, one is Aboriginal, one is White Australian. Both mothers have had their children reunified with the fathers. How do we get child safety to see that these men are violent? They should not have access to these children. One of the fathers has been imprisoned for biting the partner's tongue in half. She has 16 stitches. He's a drug dealer. He's a drug cooker. And child safety is well aware of this, but they have just reunified the children with him. The other father is still abusing his ex partner through text messages. And it doesn't matter what I say to child safety. They're just turning the blind eye. So how do we get child safety to recognise that this is still, as Ross said, it's still mother shaming. This is still breaking the mothers mm -hmm. by reunifying those children with the abuse part when the mothers are doing everything they can to improve their lives. Do you have the magic wand? Oh, I wish I had a great answer to that. I mean, I, I'm horrified. I actually hadn't heard that specific that, that that was happening. I mean, it's shocking. But it does point to all of those lack of understanding of how family violence works. I don't think we've got that embedded in our teaching and learning around. It's not just physical abuse towards the mother. It's a much wider net that these abusers cast. I mean, the problem too, I think, is the way women come across. Um, one thing I didn't mention was that some of the women in my study, wealthier women, obviously, who have access to these resources, they go and get uh, court fit so that they can cope with the court system so they're not looking angry or sad or unable to speak or whatever. So I think a lot of these abusers seem to come across as really rational and sensible, uh, you know, that she's crazy. And she is crazy sometimes. That's the problem as well. She's terrified of him. She's been gaslighted for years. She doesn't know whether it's him or not. And, and that's the whole setup. So I, I don't know why they don't understand that. I don't know. I mean, Right. Which is another point, but there should be a, 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 a point where the child safety officers are going, okay, we need to investigate this. But they say they do, but... Is there, is there more work that can be done on um, risk assessment uh, in relation to risk assessment, family violence risk assessment tools and their relationship with the children of the family, maybe? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's... Yeah. One of the children said that she can't sleep because that he's always yelling at Auntie. Yeah. And it's, it's horrifying. Yeah. Like, she's living here like her father. And he's in a new relationship. Still fighting. There's still TV going on there. Yeah. And Charles A.D. has stopped his access for two months while I investigated things. But then we invited the child with him. And I, think, I think there's probably a... Yeah, that is such an awful situation and, and 
you know what, I, I guess the really awful thing is that I don't think you're describing any, an isolated incident no, either. So, um, yeah, and it is one of the dilemmas I guess we all, we all confront. Um, jo? Thanks, Deb. Thank you, Heather. I'm really at an amazing uh, presentation. Uh, I'm a JCE student, but also work at a homeless shelter for women, or homeless centre for women. And um, I suppose I, I see all those things, I think, with the women I work with every day. Um, I was just wondering, I'm really, I'm really keen to look at this bench book, but I was really keen what response you had from the League of Fraternity. How is this going to be, sort of, this education process going to happen from here? Yeah, look, I, I actually, I'm kind of hopeful, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, um, there's, there's, a, there's, there's certainly magistrates who, I, we can probably name them, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not going to, but I think some of us could name the problem magistrates. You, you will probably see the inconsistencies between magistrates. But I feel like there's a real improvement here and uh, there's a real interest and engagement from magistrates. So, for example, now um, there is a worker uh, task to educate magistrates about domestic and family violence placed with the Justice and Attorney General's Department. So that's their job is to roll out materials for magistrates, make sure they're getting appropriate continuing education around this issue and regularising it. So Tuesday lunchbox lectures and things like this. So that's really helpful. It's just making it, normalising that into their daily work is really important, I think. Thinking about these issues in that context is really important. So I think that's helpful. Um, and I think also the um, Queensland Law Society's guidelines for lawyers is also helpful useful, important, um, but I mean there are some really disturbing things. So one of the disturbing things I think is really problematic is that what we see is we see family law lawyers working with people on family law and they flick the protection order over to the criminal lawyers to deal with the criminal law protection orders. I would like to see family lawyers who, who theoretically mostly, and there are some really complex cases that last for a long time, which most of us, they're the ones we see, but generally it's a problem-solving court, whereas the criminal court is very adversarial. So I would like to see that behaviour stop, for example. But how it's going, I hope it's going well, but yeah, it's hard to say. Any other questions? Yes, down the back. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was wondering, what do you mean Oh, yeah. And three or four years I've been in school, there's been nothing brought to at least two schools I work in, anything to bring awareness to the parents or the teachers. Right. Uh, I have approached my school once about it. Yep. And they pretty much weren't interested in their hands and sand. Right. Uh, these things are great, but I suspect the majority of the people here are people that work within the social worker world. I think we need to go to where the need is. I was wondering if there is people that are employed in these positions to do that. Yeah, there, is, there are some programs around, and others might know various examples, but certainly Our Watch, that's their, one of the important things. I mean, you could look it up on the web and see if there's any connections you can make, and they might be able to send people out to, or provide materials for you to roll out programs within the school. Um, Our Watch is a really big organisation and that's their focus, is awareness and, and focused on community-wide, including younger people. Um, there's also a program at Griffith as well, Griffith University, um, that I'm aware of, that they travel out to schools and do awareness training, mostly in high schools. I'd be happy to share that information with you because I can't remember the woman's name off the top of my head, but they've got a funded program at Griffith University. There are bits and pieces, but I agree, I, I, don't, I don't know what the um, Queensland government response is within the education department, and that's really what you're saying should happen, and I think that's right. Yeah, I think, like, the majority of the places target high schools. Yeah. Uh, and I work at primary schools, and the biggest thing I find at schools that schools struggle with There are three big students for schools in Wyoming. Yes. And they seem to be three less things that schools seem to even concentrate on. Yeah. Um, and we don't really have anyone, like there's no one in the job, but that is their job to tackle those things within the schools. Yeah, okay. What about the counsellors? School counsellors? No such thing? Or? Yeah. There is. Counsellors are 
like, council is a good, but I think there should be some employee that actually goes to schools.
What I mean is you need to, when you're working with families, see different sides and different perspectives. Here in council, in this very room three years ago, I think it was, there was a one-day workshop on working with fathers. And one of the men in Finn participated in that and talked about his experience. And following that, we saw great improvements in the way um, grassroots workers did work with fathers. But also we're now witnessing that favouring fathers seems to have led to a kind of entrenchment of mother blaming. It's as though people can't weigh this up and there's a favouring fathers even when the risk factors are there and women are still blamed, they're still so readily seen as mad when they're suffering from perhaps PTSD, from living with the long-term <coughs> effects mm, of coercive mm, and controlling mm, behaviour. Mm. And uh, I guess we, we see that as a real challenge now. There is a need, in fact, for a, a new part of this new wave in responding and learning about domestic violence we need a new feminist approach in it too, to actually talk about the need for strength-based work with women yeah. and to keep women and children together. This we see in Finn, Bobby's already sp spoken very well about that. I want to tell you a bit of a good news story about another Finn parent who was in the district court um, charged as a collaborator with her ex-partner in abuse of the children. And the judge there, the district court judge, must have done a very good, intensive, in-depth education on domestic violence. Good. Because he lectured the jury for a quarter of an hour about the effect of coercion. Um, and there was a very good outcome mm -hmm. in the case. That's great. So, if only more of the legal mm, profession mm. would yeah. would take this yeah. up and yeah. we see it in practice, hopefully yeah. over the time to come. The other thing I wanted to comment on was the continuation of abuse. You talked about systems abuse and the, using the court process to do it. And we see this with families in Finn, particularly using the family court processes. Yeah. And I think family court seems to be rather resistant to thinking they need to learn anything about anything. And I think they most need to learn about domestic violence and mm. its effect on yep. people and to take it seriously because far too many children are being placed in the custody of perpetrators. Mm. Yep. So I want to thank you very much for giving us a very stimulating social justice lecture. Thanks, Rose. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. trying to walk away. <laughs> trying to escape and that's not happening. Sit down. My apologies first off for choking in front of you. I'm <laughs> really <laughs> exposing all of my flaws <laughs> out here today um, yeah. with, without, uh, without any barrier whatsoever. Um, look, we probably have one or two minute, more minutes if there was another question or comment that um, it comes to the fore as a result of Rosa's response. I think she's been able to um, put many of the things that Heather has spoken about into the perspective of this area and the context of her work as well as social justice and social action as well. Question. Mm -hmm. Plenty. <laughs> yes, go. Um, they, um, when it goes before the courts, do they um, look into um, the history of the perpetrator? Because like, you know, you're talking about patterns and behaviours and stuff like I mean, a family in the past that that was yep. something that didn't happen, like each individual breach was the same. So the problem with the criminal or the in the criminal justice process, the evidence rules are different. We're actually going to have a workshop on this next year because I think this is a real problem. But the evidence rules say that evidence which is more prejudicial than probative, more kind of useful, if it's more prejudicial to the defendant than it is useful to prove the incident, should be excluded. Now, something like previous similar actions is incredibly 
probative, really good evidence that this is likely to happen with this person again, but it's also incredibly prejudicial. So, but so often that evidence will be excluded as a result. And um, so the test in relation to that exclusion question is a really important one. And there's, there's differing views about exactly where the cutoff is for more prejudicial than probative. But this is a real problem in the family violence sector because you have this continuing pattern of history and yet you can only look on the incident. And this is the central problem with criminal law is it's very incident focused. And so you have to prove that single incident. So yes, it's a problem. How do you bring it, like can you get case studies Lots of what there was information could have been used. Wouldn't have been good. Uh, look, it, de it's, it depends on the circumstances and it depends on the jurisdiction. It's a lot easier to get that material into the family court and into getting a protection order. But in the criminal justice system, the focus is on ensuring that we don't find a person um, guilty if there's any doubt. So there's a higher level of protection to perpetrators in the criminal justice system. It's a proof question. Uh, and, you know, there are issues about winding that back too because, you know, obviously if a woman is in front of the court, she wants that proof standard. So there is that problem with the law in relation to evidence, I think. But it's not easy to resolve necessarily. Okay, good question. So there was a question here and then a Yeah, yeah uh, I'd just like to make an observation. Uh, Something very important which has been raised about the, the old terminology of early intervention. Yeah. Uh, I work in the field of youth detention, and due to the change of legislation by the government in February this year, 17 year olds are now treated as juveniles. Since that change, um, and the, the number of juveniles that have come into the youth justice system, breaches of domestic yeah. violence orders is staggering. Yeah. And I think, as the gentleman said earlier, there's no better place than to educate people than in the school system. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a bit of an issue with the use of protection order processes. I think police overutilise protection orders when actually in some cases it should be criminal justice responses. Um, and protection orders aren't always the best thing for certain people. Um, for example, they're often used by police in small communities where there's Aboriginal people who are inevitably going to have contact and inevitably going to breach. And they're perhaps not the right response. So we really need to think carefully about what the right response is in each context as well. But yeah, you're right, in terms of an education opportunity. Um, but I think there are some issues too with um, the use of the protection order legislation. Overuse of it by police. But that's, and that's an interesting comment yeah, today about so many of the juveniles that you're seeing that the, the offence is around domestic violence or the breaches, so thanks for that observation. Yes, before the introduction of 17 year olds, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they were very rare indeed. Yeah. I have to just come forward. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank you, Linda, for that uh, really thought provoking uh, conversation that you had with us. And also to acknowledge the great contribution that this process has done in this area in terms of your vision of social justice and how in North Queensland we need to respond. And just by hearing the uh, response from the audience as an academic and as an academic group within this uh, university, what should be our response in moving this agenda forward so in terms of the uh, ideas around working in with multidisciplinary you know, colleagues, for example, mm -hmm. talking about policing, so criminology. Department, psychology, we've got education, we've got social work. So, Professor Rose, I would just uh, want to ask you about your vision. How we need to take this agenda forward in responding to this issue in North Queensland? Well, I think you've already sort of responded to it yourself in a way by identifying all the different disciplines who need to be gathered on board. Maybe one of your you're good. You're, you're very good at organising conferences, eh? <laughs> <laughs> bringing them all together. But I think it is. There does need to be a springboard yeah. for some sort of action in bringing, you know, really making it clear that this is a second wave of I, domestic violence. Yeah, I, when I was um, at one of the visitors programs that you mentioned in Durham, there was a fabulous thing by uh, Nicole Westmarland. Some of you might have come across her work. I think she's um, sociology. 
and uh, she had set up in the University of Durham, and I wanted to do this at UQ, and I still want to do this at UQ, which was a violence network um, with colleagues from different disciplines, so you could actually talk to each other about the way your discipline was dealing with it and what resources you might share and those kinds of things. So that might be some way to do it as well, is to set up a network around um, James Cook of people in different disciplines who have an interest in this area so that you can feed into your schools and into the professional development of those different areas. I also just wanted to your uh, question about how do we actually reach out to the local communities? Because yes, that's there's, true there's a lot of education that happens in the Actually, one of the things also that Nicole, so she had this uh, violent net, violence network at um, Durham University, um, and it was on Monday mornings, and it was coffee from 10 till 11, and different people would come, not always the same group could always come, but they always had some from the community invited as well. So there was that sort of a potential for exchange. So they'd have a DV worker from a shelter or they'd have a men's group worker. And so they would just be there, they'd talk a little bit about their work and then suddenly all of the people in that room had a new contact and that person also had a contact with all these other people working in academia. So it was a quite a good exchange model. I, I actually want to repeat that at UQ. So you should do that here, yeah. Yes? I The, the, look, the study I worked on the, that I kept mentioning the women coming from the stories, that was women, uh, cisgender women with male partners. Look, I selected that group because of the sheer numbers and it was a very mainstream group. There are other studies, um, increasing numbers of studies, interested in other groups. Actually, on the Bench Book website, we have a section on LGBTIQ communities and we have a whole lot of resources on the website for that community. So you can kind of see some of the research that's being done there in law, in relation to law. Okay, yes. Um, thank you for um, your very informative talk. It's sort of very um, sad to see how much <coughs> domestic and family violence is getting, you know, from my perspective. Um, I suppose with this gentleman's question, a question about how do we reach out to people in terms of like, well, you know, academics will inform people coming today. One of the things that I think is a positive thing that, um, for example, Caritas have Women for the World Month for the whole of September. And so in a small way, I was thinking, well, what can I do? So I hosted um, an event, which is on this Saturday, to actually raise awareness because I'm a yoga teacher. Now, a lot of people I find now don't want to talk so much about domestic violence. A lot of people at a grassroots level sometimes say, oh, yeah, well, it happens, and it's not happening to them or a family member. But I think yoga making a difference, and actually having it is that with the um, posters of what Caritas do in terms of helping women with domestic violence overseas and with their shelters and whole focus on a broad range of things gets people to actually look at that without me having to. Yeah. You know, right. So for me, it's sometimes those little things you can yeah. do that we incorporate into a bigger. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah. Good, good. Being thing. prepared to have a conversation or to, or to yeah. put on a poster or to have yeah. it as part of yeah. something that's effort. Yeah. Cheryl. Um, I just think I, I just want to finish on something quite positive. Great. Right. That we, we, you know, and it's not to take away from anything that we talked about. These are all real issues and. And many of us in this room work with domestic and family violence each and every day, unfortunately. But um, I've had an experience quite recently in a coffee van that I go to um, most of the morning. So I yeah, put my addiction on the table. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the woman that worked, the, and, and the, the people that work in that coffee van actually um, said to me, they, they knew the sector I worked in, and they wanted resources from me because they said to me in the last few weeks, that they had two women actually come to the coffee van in the morning and talk to her about different incidents that happened and they were quite fearful. But she stood there and she wanted to do something about it. She was not anyone with any form of experience in our sector. Um, she was just a person that each and every day sold coffee and let me give her a plug, it's the coffee tree next to Pimlico High School. And she absolutely really wanted to help people and she she had no idea where to go to. She just, and 
funnily enough, she remembered where I worked and um, but but you know I took resources to her and she was really keen to be able to actually say, I'm I'm, I'm okay with women actually displaying it to me. What what can I do? What can where can I send them? How can I get them help? Yeah. And I think, you know, we we've, we've seen years of, of people like Rose Batty talk about this in the media. Yep. It is on the table. We are all talking about it. We talk about it to our family, to our friends. Social media is huge. It is getting somewhere. And for that to just, this literally a few weeks ago, That's someone right. to ask about it and to be really yeah. proactive, I think. Yeah. You know, we are going forward. So yeah, no, I think that's great. Thanks, Heather. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I, I heard of a similar program with hairdressers in Victoria. It's actually become yeah. formalised though, but um, and so because a lot of hairdressers are in a similar position yeah. when they're chatting away and there's disclosures made and what to you know hairdressers who are unskilled in this area necessarily and might not know what to how to respond. So some help for them to kind of give resources to who's talk, who they're talking. It's great. It's fantastic. Absolutely. I, th I think we will um, need to finish up there. I did promise people 7.30 and I've gone a little bit over. I did want to ask Bobby if she would like to come down and just um, present you with a gift, <laughs> which Peter will be sure Bobby has before she comes down. <laughs> <laughs> Teamwork. <laughs> Teamwork, that's right. But um, I'll, I'll let Bobby make some comments about in that process. Your talk's amazing. It's, uh, it's good to see the staff to hear the statistics, but it's good to see that the work is so far forward and trying to get the message out there that this needs to stop. So, on behalf of Ben and JCU and all the students and the academic people that come, thank, thank you so much, Bobby. That's great. Thank you very much. And, and thanks to everybody. Yeah, it's been great to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you very much everyone for attending this 2018 Social Justice Lecture where there will be a 2019 one. Keep your emails alert to, to that announcement next year. So thanks a lot for coming along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.